Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this particular talk. Uh, my name is Vlad. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the core aspects of ad monetization. Uh, before we go a bit deeper into the topic, I want to talk a little bit about myself. So, uh, as I said, my name is Vlad Muntian. I'm a strategic partner manager. Uh, I work for Google AdMob, and my line of work pretty much focuses on working with the biggest apps and games developers from Central Eastern Europe, emerging markets, and Russia. I've been working a bit over five years with Google. I've worked in different uh, departments, including both uh, user acquisition and publishing side of the business. Now, uh, before I uh, continue with my uh, presentation further, I wanted to make a small disclaimer. So the goal of this talk is to provide a general overview of core aspects that any game developer should take into account when developing an ad monetized game or app. Uh, these aspects are based on my personal experience of working with uh, various game and app developers across EMEA and uh, in the long term should yield you uh, maximized revenue if you follow them through. Uh, they can be used by both small studios that are just starting off or by big publishing houses that sometimes need a reminder of what is really important when you try to maximize your revenue. While uh, I am directly employed by Google and work in the AdMob partnerships team, uh, this will not be a presentation solely focused on Google AdMob. And in the moments where specific examples will be required, I'll try to bring as many as I can from the industry, including other platforms and networks that are available for you as a publisher or as an advertiser. Now, uh, on this note, let's proceed to the main part of the content of the lecture. So today in this presentation, we're going to be talking about four specific aspects of ad monetization. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ads ecosystem. And I think this is a very important topic for everyone to understand, because this is usually the basis of how ads work and how you as a publisher show those ads within your application. Then we're going to cover a little bit ad networks and ad servers. We're going to talk what are the specifics, what are the differences. Uh, we're going to go a little bit through a step-by-step -step description of how an ad in particular starts with uh, a user and ends up being served to that user. Uh, the third one, what we're going to do is we're going to look a little bit at user experience and monetization based on that user experience. And the last but not the least, we're going to talk about the user, which is in my opinion, the most important part of your app. So before we go deeper in those topics, I wanted to a little bit talk about the current state of the industry and where we're at. Uh, as you can see on the slide, this is a report from App Annie from 2019. Uh, App Annie estimated that in 2020, mobile apps will generate up to uh, $190 billion. Maybe nowadays the number is a bit bigger given the state of the industry we are in now and due to COVID-19, but this was more or less the estimates. Now, 62% of all this revenue would come solely from ads. Now, this is a pretty important aspect as if you go through that same exact report, AppAni will mention that up to 5% only of the users will be paying for in-app purchases. So what about the rest? So the rest 95% represent those 62% of the revenue. Now, the goal of this talk is to make sure that you as developers, as monetization specialists, and anyone else involved in the industry understand how do you take those 95% of users that don't do in-app purchases, and how can you work with them and work with their profiles to maximize the revenue that you can get out of them using your particular apps. Now, we're going to start with the ads ecosystem. So the ads ecosystem has multiple different parts, as you can see in this particular slide. The main two parts of an ads ecosystem are the advertisers, or the buy side, and the publishers, the sell side. So the goal of an advertiser is to reach their target market or audience and to influence them to perform a similar action. So in, certain, in a lot of scenarios, that particular action is an event, a conversion, an action within the app, within the website, if we're talking about the web business, so on and so forth. 
Whereas for the publisher, their goal is to build an app that contains useful content to attract a specific audience of people and advertisers who actually want to serve ads in their particular app. Think about it this way. Imagine you have a neighborhood, and that neighborhood has a lot of people who have a very high income. Then a company decides to place a billboard. So that billboard, per se, and the company that builds that particular neighborhood is the publisher. And as an advertiser, what an advertiser is looking at is they're looking at what kind of people live there, where is this place, and what this particular billboard can yield the advertiser if they place that specific ad and that specific billboard. Now, given this is a more real life example, let's try to have a look at how this entire piece looks like in the, uh, our particular industry. So let's start with the four main pillars, right? We have users, we have advertisers, publishers, and app developers. Now, the users uh, engage with those ads that you try to serve. Now, the advertisers are, as I mentioned before, develop the content. Uh, they try to buy placements. They try to show their ads. The publishers, again, those who develop or who, in particular, try to monetize and sell ad placements uh, to advertisers. And app developers, who actually can be both advertisers and publishers, uh, they create the app content. They maintain the app. They create. Uh, they can serve both both advertisers and publishers and actually be both of those at the same time. Now, let's start a step-by-step -step sort of process of looking how that do all of these different players in the industry and the ads ecosystem interact. So we'll stop, uh, start with the app developers. So what the app developers do is they create an app. Right, like you have seen a lot of different games, a lot of different apps. When you go in, there is another app that is being served and that is talking specifically about other apps or games in the market. At the same time, uh, the app developer may create an ad placement within their app. So, again, this is sort of a two sided piece where you create ads to show your app to users out there, but at the same time, you place ads within your app to show it to the users in your app to try to make an additional revenue out of that. Now, the advertisers buys the ad placements from the publishers to serve them. So again, app developers create the ad. That ad goes uh, is treated as a part of an advertiser side that is being uh, served on the publisher side. Now, <clears throat> what the publisher does is the publisher fills their ad placement with the advertiser's ads, and it shows it to the end user who is within that particular app. Now that we've covered um, the ads ecosystem, let's talk a little bit more in detail on how the specifics of it work in the mobile space and in the app space. So in the next section of this presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover two key aspects of uh, the ad business and the ads, how they're being served and how their ads are being chosen to be served in a particular app. So we're going to talk about two things, the ad servers and the ad networks. We're kicking off with looking at the ad network. So an ad network can be easily explained. An ad network is pretty much a demand source. So imagine there is a poll of advertisers uh, who want to serve specific campaigns, specific ads. Now, these pools are um, uh, pools are actually managed by a particular company. Usually, it's a tech company, uh, as we're in the tech industry. Uh, and what that tech company tries to do, or ad network company tries to do, is it tries to connect the advertiser with the publisher. The ad server, on the other hand, is a slightly different player. So the ad server, or how a lot of people uh, like to call the ad servers is like mediation platforms in the business. The mediation platform, what it does, it, it tries to pick which ad network is the most suitable for a given request and tries to serve the ad from that ad network to the end user. You can see this illustrated right here on this slide, right? So let's go step by step. So we have an app, right, that installs a particular a software development kit on that app. Now, that software development kit communicates with the ad server. 
So what happens is that there is a user who walks into the app, uh, enters the app, starts browsing, and there, there is a moment where you can serve that person a particular app. So what happens is that software development kit pings the ad server and tells, hey, by the way, there is this user who is ready to be served an app. Now what the ad server does, or again, the mediation platform does, is it has a list of different ad networks that it starts pinging and asking, hey, do you have any bits for a user like this? This usually, this approach of calling one network after another is called a mediation waterfall. It's specifically called a waterfall because the calls usually happen one after another. So in this particular slide, it would ask the yellow network first if it has what to serve, then the go, it, go, it would go for the green, then the blue, then the purple, so on and so forth. You can have a very large uh, waterfall stack here. Now, what happens is these networks send these bits back to the ad server, and that server picks the winning bit and serves it in the app. <laughs> So in the market, there are several, several different players in this space. So when it comes to the ad networks, you would know most of these uh, ad networks that I have here presented. So I myself work with AdMob. There is obviously Facebook, the Facebook audience network. We have AppLove and we have Unity. We have Iron Source, so on and so forth. Now, some of these ad networks also provide an ad server or mediation solution to you as users and as um, uh, players in the industry. So AdMob also provides a uh, platform for you to mediate. So does Mopub, so does Iron Source. Now, Facebook, on the other hand, for example, is a player who decided that uh, just having an ad network and serving ads is enough for their business, and they would rather leave this uh, entire affair of building an ad server and a mediation platform to other players. And this is where all the other ones uh, join in. Also. You, as a developer, if you really want to, and you have the resources and the time, uh, you can actually create your own ad serving platform, uh, your own internal one, and skip all the other ones that are available in the market. Set it in the way that you want to have it automated, in the way that you want it uh, automated. Totally up to you. Now, given that we've covered the basic parts, just like in the previous uh, section of this presentation on ads ecosystem, let's have a walk through step by step of how an ad is going to be served. And we're going to start from the user. So as you can see, we have here a tip, more or less typical user. Uh, it's a male. He's uh, 25 years old. He likes to download gaming apps. Uh, these are some very, very, very simple elements uh, that any particular ad server will use in order to identify that user and try to uh, get um, ad networks to serve particular ads. Obviously, in real time, there are way more criteria than just these three that are being used uh, for serving a particular ad. <clears throat> Now, what happens is that this user data is being sent to uh, all the different ad networks out there. So uh, as I mentioned before, if you have a waterfall, it can be two, three, five, uh, 15 different networks, right? So the, the ad server will send all this user information to those networks in order to get a, a return of a particular bid that the ad network is ready to pay for this given user to serve them an ad. Now. Again, as I mentioned before, depending on different platforms, these networks can either bid one after another, or some can bid in parallel. Uh, there is a new technology emerging called real-time bidding. I'll mention it a little bit later in this presentation, but that even more simplifies this particular process of getting the bids from different networks. Now, again, let's come back to this. So network A and network B, they would build simultaneously uh, for the given user. They would uh, generate the specific ads that they're ready to serve, uh, and they will uh, send the price to back to the ad server. Now, what the ad server is going to do is it gonna, it's going to look at the given price and the given ad, and it will try to uh, rank up who would be paying the most out of these two networks to serve either one of these two ads to the given user. Now. Again, as I mentioned, the ad server picks. And once an ad is picked, that ad is being served directly into the given app. Uh, 
Now, again, this is just an example of how, let's say, a banner ad would be served. Obviously, there are multiple different formats, which, again, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail a bit later in the presentation. There are multiple different formats that uh, are there, and all of them will have a slightly different way how they're displayed. But the principle of how an ad goes from the information based on the user to it being served remains exactly the same. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit, as I mentioned before, about some emerging technologies in this space. So what I've mentioned up until now, this is, has been an industry standard for quite some time. You pick an ad server or a mediation platform. You pick the ad networks that you want to serve. You set up that particular mediation waterfall where you set different prices based on the position of the particular call to a given network. And you get return if there is an ad for that money, you get a, a return, you serve it to your user. Now, uh, the industry has been changing uh, as of late. And uh, there have been a couple of new different technologies emerging that uh, I think it would be useful to mention here, both to those who are just maybe starting off with ads monetization and those who are like seasoned veterans. So the first one that comes to my mind is the emergence of real-time bidding. So real-time bidding is pretty much what I've mentioned before with different networks bidding in parallel to serve their ad. But this time, they all do it in one particular simulation. So imagine, again, there is a user, uh, male, 25, likes to play games, right? Uh, what the real-time bidding does, it, it pings straight away all the given networks that are uh, in your particular setup. Uh, so if you can look at the two screenshots here, we have ad network one, two, and three. It bids all of them in parallel and asks, what do you have to serve right now for this user? They all send back the particular bids, and then the system just picks which one is the highest one in real time. It doesn't have to go as with the traditional waterfalls where it's First, it would ask the highest price. Then if there is no ad to serve, it would go to the second. If there is no ad to serve, it would go to the third, so on and so forth. Now, this technology is emerging across all the biggest uh, monetization platforms. And again, as I mentioned before, you can even, you even have the possibility to build your own real-time bidding uh, uh, system in-house. Uh, but again, different players are going to bring different uh, benefits to this particular system. So for example, on our side, uh, on AdMob, we have around 14 or 15 networks that are right now available to bid in real time. And the benefit, obviously, for this particular real time bidding is that if you, again, pay attention to the two graphs that I have in this slide, uh, what you have is, and you can see, let's if we look at the, let's say, ad, ad network three, right, the red one, you have Seasonal fluctuations based on different events, uh, different time periods. Uh, there may, might, uh, might be some declines in terms of advertisers for a given network, while another ad network is going to remain stable, uh, while the third one is actually increased the total amount of advertisers and obviously increase the amount that they can uh, serve and the price that they can serve. So when you have a traditional waterfall, what might happen is sometimes you actually might miss out on these different spikes, and you might not end up yielding your maximum revenue. So what this does is it tries to hit the maximum revenue for every single ad network, for every single impression that you're about to serve. And as you can see on the graph on the right, it's going to try to constantly serve the highest potential bid that is right now available. Now, uh, again, two other emerging technologies, which for some networks have been part of uh, their offering for quite some time. Uh, I'm sorry, not networks, but ad servers. Um, for other ad servers, they're new. So a couple of things here. I think these are the most important for you to understand uh, and to use in order to maximize your uh, revenue. So the first one is A-B testing. Um, this one is available on multiple platforms. It's available on Admo, Byron Source, Mopop, so on and so forth. Uh, so what you can do is you can create different approaches to your waterfall setups, and you can try to test it on different population sizes. So a couple of examples that I mentioned in the presentation is that you can just test different waterfalls where you have a totally different setup of networks. Uh, you can test a waterfall versus a hybrid 
monetization. A hybrid monetization is when you use both waterfall and real-time bidding in the same um, mediation in order to, again, maximize your revenue. Uh, you can also test clean waterfall versus clean real-time and see which one works best for you. In some cases, you can test it on 1, 10, 50% of the population. Obviously, different platforms are going to have a different approach to this. Uh, the last one, which is, in my opinion, not a really important thing for you to uh, pay attention to and know is the uh, lifetime value data. So this is, again, available on multiple different platforms. Uh, what it gives you, it, it gives you the possibility to put that dollar sign value on every single impression that you serve. And given this, you're able to build a very detailed user level uh, lifetime value revenue. So what does that really mean is that you're able to understand what users are the most profitable for you. Uh, and you're able to look at how do those users behave what do they do so different to other users? And based on that data, draw some certain conclusions on what you have to do in your particular app in order to maximize, again, that particular revenue. But just looking, again, at the users that bring you the most revenue, comparing their behavior to the lowest one, and adjusting your user experience in the app. I'll have some water. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so let's continue. So the next part of my presentation is going to focus a lot on in-app user experience. Now, the first two were a basic explanation of how the ecosystem works and how the mediation works and what you can expect more or less from those technologies to do and how they work in order to serve those particular ads in your app. Now, the second part of the lecture is going to focus on your app in particular, and it's also going to focus on your users. Now, when it comes to um, the different elements of user experience, uh, we in the Admo Partnerships team look at four elements in particular when we work with our partners. So we look at onboarding. Uh, by having a great onboarding experience, you obviously increase the likelihood of your sort of first time users becoming your regular users, then returning back and using your apps again. Uh, then we look at things like engagement. So this is understanding what kind of activities uh, your users do in your app? How are they immersed? Is there a good uh, state of flow across your app where you go from one particular, let's say, if it's a game with missions, right? You go from one mission to another to a third one. You get involved somehow into the meta uh, universe of your game, so on and so forth. The third thing that we look, as, uh, look at is the retention. So the retention, obviously, at the end of the day is super important, especially like if you're more focused on building hyper-casual or casual games, being able to retain those users and make sure that they come back not only on day two and day three, but also on day seven, day, day 14, day 30, will yield you a, a maximum potential revenue from those users, as it will increase the lifetime value of that particular user. And the last, obviously, uh, but not the least, is how do you do your monetization? So I'm, here I'm going to talk about a couple of principles of uh, monetization and how uh, user experience impacts this element and the other way around. So uh, we're going to start with onboarding. So for onboarding, we have four particular elements that I believe are really important for you to take into account. Uh, this is also the belief of my colleagues uh, and of our specialists that look into UX consultations uh, with our partners. So these four elements are pretty much the following. So we're going to start with the first one, right? Uh, downloading, launching, and your first session experience. So this is one of the most crucial pieces, right? And like the, one of the first things that you need to nail down with your particular users is that they it should be a seamless flow of how they download when they launch it and how they engage with the entire app at the very beginning. So here you need to have a couple of elements that you should take into account. First is uh, 
I would recommend you to use available authentication solutions on the market. So this can be if you're building for Android, Google Play services. Uh, iOS obviously will have a different solution for this. You can use one of the available authentication systems on uh, different platforms. You can build your own. There are a lot of ways how you can go about this. But the idea is that the simpler you make it for a user to authenticate and log in, the easier it's going to be for them to continue using your particular app. And obviously, this also encompasses around the whole simplification of user profile setup. Like, don't try to ask your user for a lot of details and a lot of information in the very first session, right? Uh, or don't ask, try to ask them to rate your particular app. Give them some time. Give them some space. Make sure that they can enter and begin the session as quick as possible. And then you can play around with other elements. <laughs> now, um, now, once the user is in game, uh, you can do a quick overview of the UI and the game mechanic for that particular user. So these are usually like easy to track step-by-step uh, -step guides uh, implemented by the particular developer, by you, uh, in the app, where it points the user what to do, how to interact with the UI, how to interact with the game mechanic. Um, obviously, the more complex the game is, the more complex this entire piece is. Uh, as you know, for example, hyper-casual games, they would try to tend to do it as simple as possible. Uh, nowadays, we have even an emergence of hyper-hyper-casual games where it's just literally one click, one tap of your finger in order to uh, play the particular game. Now, once that, that is done, uh, the next step for you is to set up trackable events and progression funnels. So for this, you can use like different analytical software. Uh, you should measure in percentage uh, of your first day session length, progress, attrition, uh, so on and so forth. You need to look at a progression of these entire pieces uh, throughout the game. You need to look at your first day's um, time, how much the user spent time within your app. And obviously, this will come into play a bit later uh, down the line. And the last but not the least, obviously, is A-B tests. As I mentioned before, their A-B tests are emerging a lot in the industry, and they have become a pretty much golden standard for any developer to understand what is the best approach to take to a given app, what is the best icon to pick, uh, what is the best UI to do, so on and so forth. So uh, use A-B tests for your benefit to understand what is the most optimal, the best aborting experience for your given users. Moving on, uh, let's talk a little bit about engagement. So uh, when it comes to engagement, there's obviously also a ton of different things to pay attention to. Uh, and I'm just going to be scratching here the surface with these four. But nevertheless, these are the four that, in my opinion, are the most um, missed by app developers and the most uh, useful for a given app developer, again, to maximize the given revenue for your app. So let's go one by one. Uh, let's start with more sort of obvious uh, and needed for any game developer that tries to go a bit more global. So this is translation and localization. Um, there are multiple things, how, approaches how you can do this. Um, different app developers would uh, do it differently. So you can use freelancers, or you can use a translation agency that uh, can do all the translations and localizations. Um, make sure that uh, they're culturally adjusted to the given uh, market that you're trying to serve these. Make sure that you not only translate the app, you also translate different messages within the app. You make sure that the app store has a better description. Uh, you can also make sure that uh, your app store optimization is localized, your user acquisition creatives are localized, push notifications, so on and so forth. As long as you make sure that for a given language, you have the full package of uh, engagements that are available for your users translated to that given language, you will be more or less safe to hit good retention numbers in that given market. The next thing is try to adjust the level of difficulty based on the user savviness. So nowadays, it's, it can be automated uh, quite easily. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Unity has one of the features built in already that can automatically adjust the level of difficulty for different users. Uh, obviously, different developers can do it by themselves. But what this also impacts is impacts the whole user experience of making sure that that user either doesn't get an overly difficult 
level where uh, they just cannot pass it and they quit the game, or at the same time, it doesn't make an overly simple level so that the user gets bored as fast as uh, possible and also leaves the particular app. Uh, third thing, try offering free bonuses and check-in bonuses to the user. So uh, this can vary from, obviously, app to app. But the idea is you need to reward your users for coming back into your app uh, to make sure that you, know, you reward their loyalty and their interest in your particular app. You don't need to start doing this on day two, obviously. Like you can play around with this, uh, obviously, as I mentioned before, A-B tests. Uh, you can look into giving them some kind of bonuses on day three, day four, maybe weekly check-ins. Uh, but obviously, this will also boost a little bit. Uh, the usage of and the engagement of your particular app. And now, the last but not the least, this is a bit more difficult uh, to accomplish, especially given if you're a small developer and you're just growing. Uh, but obviously, if you work with like a publishing studio, they can help you out a, a lot in this particular aspect, is you need to try to aim to build a community uh, around your particular app, around your particular experience that you're trying to deliver to users, and make sure that those users not only engage with your app, but they try to start engaging with themselves throughout this entire uh, gaming experience that they're having with your app. Um, as an example, I had this particular partner. Um, they have existed uh, three or four years, I think, on the market. Um, not a single uh, time did they spend a dollar on uh, user acquisition. What they did is they spent a lot of their effort into building a community around their given app. Uh, and that has yielded them a lot of results. They started off by uh, making uh, five figures in revenue. The second year was six figures. Uh, third year was seven figures. Fourth year uh, it was eight figures in revenue uh, coming in that particular app. And again, as I mentioned, they've spent zero dollars on user acquisition. It was all focused on the community around the app. The next piece, as I mentioned before, is retention. So while, again, there are a lot of different principles that you can take into account, I'm going to talk in particular about just two of them. So the first one is measurable events. This is a very important one, and a lot of developers actually skip this particular step. Um, you can use a lot of different software to do this. For example, we as Google offer Firebase as a solution uh, that has this inbuilt functionality of measurable events. I'm not trying to say that this is the only solution on the market. There is multiple other solutions that you yourself can pick for yourself. Uh, but the point here being is that you need to start measuring a lot of things within your app in order to be sure that your app is healthy, you're hitting healthy numbers, and you are seeing a progress when it comes to implementing different changes in your UI. So things like measuring the retention on day one, day two, day seven, 14, 30, so on and so forth. Uh, you need to work with your internal business intelligence teams uh, and try to understand what are these numbers mean for you, how are they compared to your other apps, or how are they compared, for example, to the industry or to your peer group of other developers that sort of develop the same genre and same type of, type of game as you. Um, obviously, you need to compare them over time to see uh, month over month, uh, quarter over quarter, year over year, how the progression is going. Uh, you can track a bunch of other elements within your game. Uh, you can look at things like crashes and how, for example, crashes can potentially impact retention. Uh, you can look how new updates impact your user metrics. Uh, you can use uh, look how new mechanics can potentially change the way how people interact with a given element or a given uh, place within your app, let's say you introduce a new mechanic that uh, sort of pushes and uh, rewards a particular user by watching an ad, uh, you, as also based on this, you can try and look at new or different monetization practices within your app and try to compare them. But again, these comparisons are only uh, as good as the data you get out of them. So, having these event, uh, events and measuring them is going to be very useful for you as a company to do. Uh, the second piece for retention is uh, push notifications and retargeting. So uh, these are a little bit different uh, uh, 
purely based on the fact that the push notifications are pretty much free, whereas retargeting or how others in the industry call it as remarketing uh, is usually a paid service and you need to use one of the previously mentioned ad networks to provide those ads. But both of these impact retention quite a lot, right? Uh, and they're both connected to the previous moments that I mentioned. So push notifications can uh, use catchy phrases, catchy reminders for the users to go back to do those daily check-ins or weekly check-ins. Uh, you can update the sort of push notification UI to make sure that it looks more like your game and it's more attractive to the user. Uh, now, if you would to, uh, were to do what I mentioned before is create events and uh, based on those events, collect lists of users uh, right, so let's say if you can create an event using lifetime data where you would be able to collect a list of your most valuable users, uh, what you can do is if that user uh, experiences a retention and they leave your app, you can try to use uh, the, the different platforms available to retarget that particular user with ads. Based on your game, you can work a lot on the creative itself to try to re-attract that user back into your app so that they come back and they start engaging. <clears throat> now, given that we've walked through the sort of three main elements of uh, UX, uh, the next piece will be focused on monetization and how, in particular, monetization and UX work together. <laughs> Before I jump into that, again, I just wanted to sort of do a quick run through as we might have uh, different people in the audience, as, those, as I mentioned, those who are just beginning or those who are experienced. I want to tackle the four main formats currently available in the market. Uh, I can mention a couple more formats that at least are emerging on our side. Obviously, different ad networks are playing around with different ones. But the four main ones are obviously banners, native, different restrictions that are rewarded. Uh, you can already see a lot of different aspects uh, and different nitty-gritty details about the particular formats in the slide itself. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to mention a couple of key elements where I think these work the best. So banners, in my opinion, they're uh, the most suitable format for uh, apps or games that have very long sessions, uh, gaming sessions or usage sessions. So I can give you a couple of sort of ideas around this. So let's say it's a puzzle game or it's a coloring app. Uh, or it's uh, some kind of, let's say, drum machine, right, um, where a user can spend on one single screen uh, up to 10, 15, 20 minutes. So if you have that particular experience and your entire interface doesn't shift, you don't have a lot of transitions from uh, one state to another state, banners are one of the most suitable uh, formats to use in this, as they have a tendency to refresh uh, between 15 to 60 seconds. Again, depends on different networks and the policies that they have. And you can serve a lot of banners to that particular user. Some of them might even catch their attention. And if they catch the attention of the user and the user clicks on the banner, you end up actually gaining even more out of that. Now, native ads are very useful if you plan to integrate ads within your user interface uh, so that it looks more or less similar to your app. Uh, these are amazing if uh, you have a game or an app where there's a lot of scrolling going uh, up and down uh, through the UI or through the meta. Uh, they are placed very nicely within that space, and you can gain uh, quite a decent amount of revenue from this. Or what you can do is you can try them as an alternative to interstitial ads because they're a little bit less um, uh, intrusive, and they also don't really provide that big of a shift in terms of colors and UI when a user transitions from one screen to another. Uh, interstitials are pretty much a golden standard in the industry. They're used all across different apps. Uh, there's a lot of different ways how to use it. Um, we'll talk a little bit more in details about this and reward it in a bit later. I'm going to walk you through a specific uh, genre of how you can use these different formats to monetize that genre. Uh, now, the last but not the least is obviously the rewarded ads. These have become really a staple of the industry now nowadays. Uh, a lot of uh, developers tend to use uh, rewarded ads not only in their apps, but uh, but also in their, uh, I mean, not only in their games, but also in their apps in a lot of different places. Uh, we see emerging 
uh, rewarded ads even in dating apps nowadays if you want to do another swipe or two, right? Like you watch a rewarded ad and get those swipes. Now, as I uh, mentioned before, and I promised, uh, let's have a quick walkthrough of a given genre uh, on how you can potentially implement different ads in this uh, genre. Uh, the one that I picked for today's lecture is Brain and Puzzle Games. Uh, my logic here was that this is one of the most common uh, game genres out there. Also, I would assume that pretty much everyone in this audience has played a brain and puzzle game at some point in their life, even at some point of the latest uh, quarantine. Uh, so this would be more or less easy to explain and uh, it would be easy for you to follow through. So as you've seen in the previous slide, uh, the two main uh, ad units that would work the best here are interstitials and uh, rewarded. Obviously, that's not the limit. You can play around, as I mentioned, with banners or with native. It really depends what kind of puzzles here we're talking about. If it's, as I said, if it's a long session, banners are ideal to be used in that long session. But outside of the long session, you also have uh, rewarded interstitials. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about some rewarded ad best practices, right? So some ideas how you can implement them, right? Uh, you can do by, uh, rewarded ads by giving the user some free coins. This requires a little bit, if you don't use coins or you don't use double monetary systems within your app, uh, you will have to work a little bit on implementing this. And also you will need to work a little bit on adjusting the economy so that um, users don't overuse the rewarded ads and that messes up your in-game economy. Uh, the rewarded ads can be used for extra steps. So let's say this is some kind of a brain puzzle game where you need to move certain moves. Uh, let's say if it's a traffic jam game, right? You need to move different uh, cars. So you might have potentially three um, steps, three mistakes that you can take. And let's say you use them all up. What you can do is you can offer the user to watch a rewarded ad to gain another two. Uh, it can also work on uh, level resuming. So uh, you're playing, uh, let's say, uh, again, a game that requires timeliness, or if there has been a couple, there has been a couple of mistakes by the user, you can resume that level, so on and so forth. Uh, I think the, the best one, especially let's say if we take a Sudoku game, right? Uh, hints and using rewarded ads on hints works very well if you're building some sort of a Sudoku or a checkers game. Now, when it comes to best practices, there is not really anything new uh, really here to what I've mentioned before is, again, track uh, uh, rewarded usage. Uh, you can use Firebase. You can use some other solutions. Uh, so dynamic gift content uh, for those who come back into your app. Um, ad countdown. So this is a, a actually a very good element for rewarded ads. So let's say uh, your user has finished a given level, has scored 100 points. And what you can offer that user is, hey, you want to make maybe 200 points, uh, double your score, or triple your score. Um, watch your rewarded ad for that. So what you can do is you can set a timer of, let's say, 10 seconds counting backward. And that will hurry up the user to consider or not to play the given ad. Now, moving forward, with uh, interstitial ads, it's more or less easier. Uh, where you can implement them. So you can implement them on refreshing a level and ending a level on returning back to the home page. Now, one thing about interstitial ads uh, and the things that you need to avoid purely on, uh, from the policy perspective, but also not only purely from the policy, but from the user experience perspective, is that try to avoid uh, serving interstitial ads when the user returns to your game. So let's say they minimize the, uh, your app and they have to go and do something in the browser or do something in Messenger, and then they come back into your app and the first thing that they see is an ad. Try to not do that. That is, it really impacts the user experience. Uh, and there's uh, the other thing is try to not show any interstitial ads if there is no screen shift. So try not showing interstitial ads in the middle of the game. Uh, show them, for example, when the level is finished and the user is getting the scores or right after the scores or let's say while, while there's a progress bar uh, and the scores are loading, you can serve a quick interstitial and then uh, show them the results. Now, 
the last piece on monetization is um, these sort of three um, aspects that you have to pay attention again in order to make sure that you have the best user experience when you use ads. Uh, this is an important step because uh, a lot of uh, users actually are not that big of fans uh, of having ads in the game. And like you can mostly notice this if you go to Google Play and you watch the different comments there. Uh, so these elements will try to minimize any potential negative reviews uh, on your Play stores. Uh, so first thing is try to not overload the waterfall. So what a lot of developers do is when they have a waterfall, uh, they try to overload it with like 50 different calls to add networks. And they build one, like the setup, and they use it globally. So what happens here is that this setup might work and, and add my serve, let's say, on your third or fourth call in US. But if you're, let's say, serving uh, this exact same waterfall in Thailand, it's going to take something like the 20th or the 25th call. So what this leads to is when you have very overloaded waterfalls is that in a lot of cases, ads actually don't end up being served. So instead of the user getting an ad, so let's say they press to watch a rewarded ad, instead of getting a rewarded ad, it gives them a message, ad failed to load. And that can bring some negative user experiences. So, a couple of advices here for me uh, is try to use maybe three to five calls to give an ad network. Uh, obviously, it depends on the policies. And this will help you identify your sort of upper, middle, and lower limits based on the match rates on the given calls. Uh, and will also help you split up that waterfall into different tiers of countries. So try using three or four tiers. And usually, the first tier would be countries like US, Japan, Korea. Uh, second tier would be uh, Britain, France, Germany, uh, Poland, Russia, and let's say third tier going to be uh, India, Brazil, uh, Bangladesh. So th the tiers depend in particular on the maximum or even the average CPMs, so cost per 1,000 impressions that you can get out of those particular countries. And it's best to build mediations that are grouped together based on different regions where the performance is more or less similar, uh, as that will minimize the amount of work you actually need to put into this entire piece. Uh, use lifetime value data in your performance assessment, obviously understanding how um, different platform, uh, different ad networks, different uh, choices of the user impact their lifetime value. Um, use this to estimate what is the current expected revenue from your user and what might be the future expected uh, revenue. So let's say you're working closely with uh, the user acquisition team. Uh, once you do a user acquisition campaign, you can look at those users that you've just acquired and try to understand how are they compared to organic traffic. And the last one is try to listen to your users. As I mentioned, they, users are very vocal, especially when they don't like something. So try looking at their feedback on Google Play and try adjusting to that. Um, track the users in your app, analyze their behavior, uh, especially around the points where you serve ads, and see if there is a potential attrition after that. Maybe it would be worth reducing a particular amount of ads. But if you're seeing that ads are not impacting your user, maybe try to look into potentially increasing the ad density within your app. Now, on this note, Again, speaking about users, and I think you've noticed that I've been talking about users starting from uh, ads ecosystem all the way down to uh, UX and monetization. Uh, I believe this is quite important for a couple of reasons. I think this slide describes it very well. The users are the ones who generate you the revenue. They're the crucial part of the ads ecosystem. Uh, they're the one who play the game. They're the one who build your community. Uh, they're susceptible to changes. And obviously, users are your most valuable asset in the game. Without, that, you, without the user, there is no playing the game. There is no serving ads. There is no revenue. So at the end of the day, the user is your customer. And you, as a business, are sort of obliged to satisfy that customer, make sure that they come back and they work with you further on and on and on. So based on this, uh, sort of at the end, uh, I wanted to mention like a couple of elements to pay attention when it comes to the user. So a couple of things. Obviously, you need to make sure that your user 
feels your care or sees your care. So engage with them on social platforms, reward them, give them gifts, uh, localize your content, make sure that you're doing all the right steps for users. Uh, acquire the right users. So test different acquisition methods, uh, invest in, into um, apps or optimization and other sort of non-paying methods of attracting users, uh, collect user lists uh, within the app, uh, looking at their in a behavior and use those lists to potential target additional users as similar lists, so on and so forth. Uh, and the last one, I think this is one of the most important ones for any given developer, uh, be genuine and unique. Uh, there's a lot of different players who, uh, you know, go out of their way to maybe potentially copy a competitor. Uh, I know I've seen developers that this is their sort of sole business model is to make a copy, uh, earn a certain amount of revenue of that copy, and then just dump it. Um, if you really, really want to maximize your revenue and you want to sort of grow your business, you need to focus on being genuine and unique. So uh, again, these are the apps that generate the most revenue from the users. Uh, they listen to the user uh, and sort of engage with them constantly. Uh, they stick, like these companies stick to their principles and make sure the users are aware of their principles and what they as a company stand for. So at the end, uh, let's do a quick recap of what we talked today. So there are sort of pretty much four main players in the ads ecosystem. It's the developer, the publisher, advertiser, and user. Obviously, the developer in a lot of cases ends up being both the publisher and the advertiser, not really the user. Uh, the ad networks are the demand sources looking to target users, while the ad servers or obviously mediation platforms, depending on uh, the slang that you want to use, help the networks find those users. Uh, while focusing on the user experience, uh, think of this framework of onboarding, engaging, retaining, and uh, monetizing those users. Uh, these are sort of key aspects of the uh, user experience, especially if you plan to use ads monetization. And obviously, the last but not the least, the user is your most valuable asset. Uh, that will be all from me. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, if you have any questions, we can try and address them in the given uh, environment. Thank you. <laughs>